Welcome to Beers with Bill Norn. This time we're going to be talking about feasts, uh, mostly about how to plan one and how to execute one from the budget stage all the way up to being on site. This time I have a rogue beer. It's a honey Kolsch. I have not had it. I'm trying to only get beers I have not had well on the stream. This is uh, from Oregon. Their headquarters is in Newport, but the uh, there's a farm outside of Independence where they ha have a farm that they do a lot of their hops on, and I think that's where they gather the honey for this um, Kolsch. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a try. It's a 5.2% alcohol and 25 IBUs if you care about any of that stuff. I try to go for low IBU stuff. I don't really like IPAs. It's refreshing beer. Has a little bit of floral at the beginning, and then a little bit of sweetness after that. And it's just a very light sweetness that stays in the mouth with a little bit of flower flavor, but not overly hoppy. So it's nice. It's good summer beer, I think. So uh, we'll talk about feasts. Um, first thing you want to talk about really is uh, the budget. Uh, now, if you want to. Read the article after that I've written on this after the video and you have questions, go ahead and let me know. I'm going to post a link to that article in the YouTube description when I put this on YouTube. And if you want it put into the or the chat here, I can do that too. Uh, so the first thing is the budget. So there's two ways to start. Either the person, if you're doing this for like a camp out or an event and there's a autocrat and you're working with them they will either talk to you about a budget and give you what their idea of the budget is and put some and you'll have to put some input or you'll be asked to create a budget so but usually it's you're given a range of money and you have to fit within that budget for me i have um been cooking for 21 years in Ampard now, and I've got a pretty fine system. It might need to be updated in the future because of inflation and stuff like that, but my ideal budget is about $3 per person. Um, I usually come in under that, although the last couple times I've done a feast um, with inflation and uh, just how prices fluctuate, I still came under the $3, but it was a lot closer than it used to be. So at some point in the future, the $3 might need to be reevaluated and might need to be increased a little bit. Uh, so for our example feast, we're going to use a 50 person feast. So we're going to have a budget of $150. And so how you go about doing a budget is you kind of come up with an idea of what you want for a meal, which really I will be talking about in more detail later. And then you kind of roughly Gauge the prices, extrapolate your recipe or guess um, by scaling it up, and then you round up and you can kind of get your budget from there. Um, when I used to do a budget, and every time I, I cook just about, I will reevaluate to make sure the $3 per person budget is still appropriate. Um, but that's what you do when you're looking at a budget. Are there any questions about um, how you? Budget. It'll make more sense um, when I talk about developing your recipe and stuff like that. I think, but it's hard to separate the two. All right. So next thing, the next thing that's really important to do is to see your site. You need to find out there's a kitchen. Um, if there is a kitchen, what does the kitchen have? Does it have cooking utensils? There's also the chance that you might have to cook off-site. Will you be able to cook at a kitchen off-site? Are you going to be cooking with fire? Oh, it's Bit of Welsh. Hello. You can chat now. Um, it's uh, Darius from Northern Lights. Uh, so you want to find out what your cooking situation is and what you can what you have to work with. Uh, if you don't have a kitchen and you have to work primitive, which is I've had to do a long time ago, you might need to change your budget a little bit to incorporate buying the things to use to cook, like firewood or coal or maybe a grill rental. 
stuff like that. So that you can ask that uh, the autocrat for extra money to be able to um, purchase Gorilla Rindle. I've never. Oh, hello, Gar. Um, I've only rented a cooking equipment a couple times. Um, myself, usually I've either done it with the fire pit or borrowed equipment or uh, used the kitchen that was on site. But it's important to figure out what you need so you can plan that into your, your budget and your uh, uh, battle plan going forward. So for uh, the meat or the meal that we'll be doing um, as an example meal, I'm going to be doing a meatloaf with uh, mashed potatoes and a green salad. So just keep that in mind. We'll be using that later for examples and stuff like that. So after you figure out your budget, you figure out what you're cooking. Um, you need to know where to shop. Well, actually, before you know what you're cooking, you know where to shop so you can price around and figure out prices and stuff like that. Uh, the major place that I go to in the Northwest, uh, United States, Northwest, Oregon, Washington, I think in Idaho, is a place called Smart Food Service. It used to be called Cash and Carry. Oh, hello. Uh, Juice Box came in a little bit ago. I missed that. I apologize. Um, with a uh, smart food service, it's a rental or a uh, warehouse, a uh, restaurant supply store. Sorry, and I buy most of my food things there. Um, you can buy bulk proteins. They usually be butchered though. They come in large pieces, uh, and I usually buy like my flatware, plates, baking trays, stuff like that. There, um, it's higher quality and it's cheaper per item from anywhere else. My second place that I use to cook at is Costco. If you don't have a restaurant supply store near you, um, Costco is a very good backup. I buy my chicken there. Um, That's pretty much the only protein I will buy there. Um, It's good chicken. I buy the frozen stuff, frozen chicken breast usually. Um, It's uh, glaze frozen. Uh, so many people. Thanks for coming in. Uh, so it's glaze frozen and it thaws really well, cooks really well. There's no prep needed. I used, I have tried going to places like Winco or Whole Foods, not Whole Foods. Uh, I forgot the East Coast version name of Winco. Anyways, go there. Um, I went there. I bought chicken thighs. It was supposed to be boneless. Cubed them up, found out that they were not boneless. They had bone spurs in them. So I spent another two hours doing deboning, and it was ridiculous. So I tend to avoid going like at Winco and cheaper places to buy my uh, proteins. But Winco still has this place. Like it's bulk spices. You can save so much money by just going to the Winco bulk spices and buying your spices there. Oregano, you might only need a dollar's worth, but if you went and bought it in a spice section, it costs three to five dollars. Um, actually, I think the last time I looked, it was like five fifty at the store I was at um, for oregano. It was a ridiculous price. So Winko, bulk foods, very important. Um, then for utensils, like you need bowls or serving spoon stuff, you can go to Winko. Cost pretty cheap. Um, yeah, you can get weed for cheaper. It's very true. <laughs> uh, the That's just how the world ends up landing. It's crazy sometimes. Um, but you can also go to the dollar store for like bowls or, and uh, serving, serving spoons, mixing spoons, stuff like that. You will want to buy your flatware, plateware, or baking tw- uh, trays at a... Um, far at the smart food service though, if you can. If not, Costco also has bulk stuff. So once you have figured out um, what you will need because of the cooking situation and what you'll need to buy that's not food, you need to figure out what your real food budget is. So basically, 
you uh, get the prices for all of your ingredients that are not food, subtract it from your food budget, and recalculate how much money you have to spend per person. So for this 50-person meal, um, we get plates, flatware, disposable sheet pans, disposable sheet pan lids. Uh, you get that from cat or from smart food services. And then from Winko, you get the serving and mixing utensils, the grater, mixing bowls. And when I priced this out uh, two years ago, when I wrote this, it came out to fifty-two dollars, leaving ninety-eight dollars for a a uh, fifty-person feast. So that's one hundred ninety-six or one dollar ninety-six cents per person for your real food budget. If you're doing this feast for a hundred people, it would leave you two dollars and seventy-five cents, just because uh, when you buy the plates in bulk, when you're buying them at one hundred twenty-five, um you have extra leftover, so it's easily scalable. Uh, you can buy smaller amounts of plates, but it's a wash because there are higher quality plates. They cost more, and so it'll end up still being $15 for like 50 plates. So it's best idea to get the 125 count for $15. It's important to do your math to see which one comes out better in the long run. It's um, part of shopping uh, and comparing and stuff like that. It's a very important skill. You can just develop it over time. Um, it can be a little overwhelming at first if you haven't really done large scale mass shop comparisons. But especially with online now, it's a lot easier to do shop comparisons. I remember a time when I couldn't do that online and I had to physically go to all the stores myself to write it down. It took a lot more time. But now with online store um, shops, it's a lot easier to price things out. Any questions about uh, the different sh stores you can shop at uh, for what kind of items and any questions about what the real food budget is? Or anyone, is anyone else drinking or is it just me this time again? Great. I'm glad I'm not alone in it. In the last couple of times I've done beers with Bailenoid, I don't think anyone else was uh, joining me for the drinkage. Are you drinking anything special? I know you have some pretty good taste in beers. The Gar is too. Nice. Boddington's. I don't know if I've had that. It does sound familiar, though. Nice white claws. I can I can deal with some white claws. Hating laws and drinking white claws. It's uh it's a good plan. Are you drinking any of the newer flavors? Oh, wine, Riesling. Then I've definitely not had Boddington's wine. Because I did not think it was a wine. But wine is good. I enjoy good wine. That's right, Boddington's is a pub ale. I had it in England. That's where it was. Boddington's. Oh. Oh, so uh, Uriel asked a little bit ago, uh, what is my... Uh, let's see. What is, what is the average price per person you get to work with in AmpGuard? Um... Mostly, uh, I've done my three dollars. People have said that's fine. The one time I did a a fancier feast is for Rosewood. It was probably the most I ever got, and because I was buying such a large bulk, um, I was able to spread it even further. And I got about three fifty a person. I told them I was going to do it on a three dollar budget. Is the one time I went over, and they were okay with the three fifty per person budget. 
because they they told me I had money to work around with. But fancy feast, yeah, Rosewood. I did a chicken, a uh, hazelnut encrusted chicken with a hazelnut risotto and a green salad with homemade honey mustard sauce. I also had a hazelnut sundae for dessert. It's probably the the fanciest feast I've done. Usually, I keep my stuff pretty pretty basic and solid, but I was given extra money, good facility, and I just wanted to write off risotto on my bucket list, so I never have to do it again. All right, so we got a real budget or a real food budget after we bought all our utensils and stuff like that. Um, now we get into the actual meal planning. You want to be creative, but use as few items as possible. Keep it simple as you can. Um, you want protein, a side, and a vegetable. Fake food. Um, usually I throw that stuff around at people. Ah, uh, that's a good question. What percentage of AmpGuard would you say hates Susie and Salt? Um, I haven't heard to make a complaint about mine, but I know it's definitely a thing because I've had food that was well seasoned and people were like, nah, it's so much salt, too much pepper, oh my god. Um, I think because you hear a lot of them complaining more, I'd say they're only probably about 15%, but they're a vocal 15%. They do hate spicy spaghetti, and I don't know why. Based on what you talked about with uh, your, the spicy spaghetti feast, which was not spicy, I think more people probably didn't like the seasoning than the 15%. But I disagree with them. Degar, yes, it was the shame that was wasted in Rosewood, but it was also the largest camp I'd ever got to cook at. So it was like 375. So I guess it's good for my stats, but that's about it. They also had a bigger budget for their food. All right, so uh, meal planning. Uh, yeah, you want to be creative. I yeah. Um, I try to be positive on here, but yeah, Rosewood. So you want a protein, a side, and a vegetable. Dessert is optional. I almost never make desserts. Um, it's a, it adds to the budget, and a lot of people don't eat them. Yes, creativity with the meal plan. Um, it's about making the best thing you can with the fewest items as possible. Because uh, less items means it's easier to execute. Um, flavors can still come through if you're creative. And it, uh, if you choose correctly, you can make meals if something goes wrong from the meals that are that was pre-planned. I, in most of my meals, especially in the past, I would always make a backup plan. So if one meal didn't turn out, I can make another meal with the items that I had provided. If I had, if I thought something might not turn out correctly, so it, that's it's, it's a step that a lot of people don't have to go to, but can go to just f to ease their peace of mind, peace of mind, peace of mind. Um, so it's something to think of, but that's a little bit more advanced. Yeah, ketchup is tangy. Definitely not spicy. It's ridiculous. I mean, there are lots of different ketchups, but I, I don't know. I had a wide variety of spices in my youth, and uh, some people have it, and that's what causes the discrepancy there. The HP. I'm not sure what you mean by the HP.
I don't think I've had HP sauce. Oh, I just don't know what HP stands for. I don't use a lot of sauces, honestly. I'm pretty basic when it comes to sauces. Hi, Gwen. So as I said, the example meal is going to be meatloaf, mashed potatoes, and green salads. Uh, the recipe I usually use is two pounds of beef, probably a half cup of shredded carrots, half cup of shredded white onions, two eggs, one cup of Italian breadcrumbs, Johnny seasoning salt. To, I do it to smell, but because you can't taste raw meat. Uh, and then you pepper and ketchup. We're talking about ketchup. You know, that spicy ingredient. Uh, this should feed about six people. That gives each person about a third pound of beef. Uh, yes, how flexible and accommodating do you feel that feast makers need to be with allergies? Um, there shouldn't be there should be some flexibility. I am flexible, but on the other hand, it's hard to make a meal for a large group of people and to take everyone's taste into account. Um, if there are people that tell me like they're uh, they're allergic to something, I will try to provide something for them to eat if I know about them ahead of time. But generally speaking, I try to keep the items that I do make be the least finicky so I don't use seafood so you don't have sh shellfish in it for example um, actually you probably shouldn't do seafood at Amgard um, it's harder to cook than you think and gets finicky and it can, if it goes wrong it goes really wrong I've had a lot of people have had a lot of bad experiences with seafood in Amgard in the Pacific Northwest so I avoid seafood but back to your point yes um, Take into account where you can, but don't change a whole meal around one person unless you really want to. Um, but you should be flexible. What about vegetarians or those weirdos who don't eat red meat? Do you plan an alternative to the main course? Um, I would consider it if there were enough people. However, I have never done that consciously. I, I mean, so yes, the answer is kind of no. But um, there's been several meals, like if you're making hamburgers, you can make a large salad out of the toppings for people that don't want the hamburgers. You can just give them extra salad. It's not, um, for some things, it's not as um, plentiful as other things. Like for the hamburger example, you can actually make a really nice salad with the toppings of hamburgers. But with like this meal that I'm talking about with uh, mashed potatoes and salad and meatloaf, really the only thing there is for vegetarians is salad. But if I know there's going to be quite a few vegetarians and I can make a side meal, um, I'd be willing to do that. And I think most people that cook would be willing to do that if they have enough warning ahead of time. But vegetarians shouldn't show up and expect to have a meal just for them if they didn't pre-plan or pre-warn the feastocrat. Um, um, that's just my personal opinion. Some feastocrats will consciously make um, vegetarian meals, um, which, is, which is nice. Uh, it's just... It changes the budget. Yeah, when adding in, uh, food restrictions on a free range form is a very nice thing to do, and it helps uh, for the planning. Oh, yeah. Um, my philosophy is a little strict compared to some other people, but I'm pretty easygoing. Um, I understand why uh, you wouldn't eat a lot of Vampire Feasts. So I've had some good ones. Um, I've had a lot of bad ones. Most of the bad ones have been seven plus years. They've been better. Uh, I tried to critique each one I'm at. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fair not to get the feasts. I know some people don't. I don't take it personally anymore.
So once you get your uh Oh, that was for the meatloaf. Um so yeah, that's how you make the meatloaf. What's the, the ingredients for the meatloaf? Uh the mashed potatoes, my secret is you, you, you don't mash a hundred potatoes. You buy some instant potatoes. You know, it's the same price. It's like a small percentage of the work. And it tastes just as good. Yep, sorry, back on topic. Um but yeah, Matt's instant mashed potatoes. I would never want to have someone mash 100 potatoes for me, especially taking credit because that's ridiculous. Yeah, not saying this ever happened or anything, but yep, potato flakes. Um, you add a little bit of extra butter, uh, you buy the kind that tells you to use milk, not just water, and yeah, usually salt to taste. You'll usually add a little bit more salt than what's in the box. Um, but yeah, mashed potatoes. And then the third thing, just a cup of salad to round out the meal. Uh, that is the veggie for this meal. Uh, the first thing you do, the first thing I did, I did whenever I cooked a meal was I did a test cook. You just cook the basic meal for six people and once it's done, you divide the portions and keep notes of the sizes so you can better estimate the uh, amount of food you'll have when you scale up your recipe. Uh, and then you, uh, once you figure out that the meal works, you check to make sure it's still in budget. You um, increase the, por- or the portion size and then um, run the calculations, calculations on the food and make sure it's still within budget. Wynn said I did instant potatoes with a meatloaf for a feast once. Super easy and way faster. Full potatoes take so long to cook. Yes. Yes, they do. Um, I've never tried to make mashed potatoes from scratch at Amp Garden because I make them for home and I I wouldn't want to do that. I just knew ahead of time I wouldn't want to do that for 50, 100 people. I mean, I might do it for a small feat like a, a barony feast because um, it's like two five quart mixing things and mashed potatoes and you got enough but yeah more than like a barony level feast i would definitely use fake pot- or uh potato flakes tater flakes as they were called um once you've done a test cook uh you need to find a helper and you can do this before you do the test cooking you can find this person at any point along the way but you need a you should always find a helper, not just a last minute helper or someone you need someone that can that you can teach the process to and you can brainstorm ideas with when you have to come overcome last minute problems. I had uh, my friend Vincent, who has cooked with me almost every single feast I've done since in the last 20 years. I think the first year I did feast by myself, but after that, Brian helped me. Vincent helped me at almost every single feast. And he was very dependable. And if you can find someone like that, that can help learn the process and understand what the issues are so you can help overcome problems along the way, it will be a great stress reliever so you don't just do everything yourself. And sometimes, like, if you're at the um, event and you have to go to the store, you can send your helper to go to the store. Or if your helper knows what's going on, you can go to the store while they are taking lead on the feast. So it's almost like getting a co-crat for like an event, but for your feast. And I think it's probably one of the best things I ever did or ever had while cooking was to make sure I had that really influential helper. So once you find your helper, you want to do a second test cook. You want to kind of turn it into a party because you're going to make a bigger cooking session. You want to invite over 10 or 15 friends over for the meal. And you're going to scale it up so you cook so three times a serving. So that's 18 servings of mashed, or mashed potato salad and meatloaf. Uh, you scale that up. You look for problems in your method. Figure out if you can correct them. Um, what are the prep times? Um, what are the cook times? How much can you cook per batch? Are you going to have to cook in batches because of your hurricane situation? Um, once you've been able to figure all this stuff out and you've had some real-world experience in this larger 
meal, you might want to change up your menu if necessary. Maybe you'll have to go back to the the, the beginning and start all over. I, I don't know. If you're doing a different menu than what we're talking about here, then you may need to reevaluate what you're doing and come up with something new. Um, but that's why the second test cook is very important. Um, a lot of people will skip the second test um, and they fail. Um, I can think of some recent examples where the autoc- the fishcrat thought they knew what they were doing. Um, they cooked just the regular meal and cooked it. They thought they scaled it up right and they got to the site because they didn't do the second scale up cook. Um, their items did not come out like they expected because they didn't do the larger cook. Um, and when you cook things in mass, things do change like rice for example <laughs> yeah if you don't like uh big parties then maybe you wouldn't want to do that i mean or you could just have a lot of leftovers you don't have to invite 10 or 50 people over when you have friends Um, then do another test cook if you have to, after you make changes. Um, any questions about, uh, test cooks? You can just test eat if you want to invite someone over to do all the cooking. Yes. I've never been invited over for a test cook. I'm um, always the one doing it. But it would be nice. All right, so extrapolate the recipe. Um, I kind of already talked about that. Um, when you extrapolate the recipe, you want to round up to the nearest whole number. Um, if you end up with more than you expected because you round up, that's okay. So I have extrapolated um, the recipe, I'm not going to go over the whole recipe. It's in the, it's in the article if you want to read the extrapolated menu. But for example, we would need 16.6 pounds of ground beef for 50 people. So you just round it up to 18 pounds. So it splits evenly. So, um, five big white onions, four pound carrots, 18 eggs. Etc. Etc. Uh, Thirty-five cups of mashed potatoes, two pounds of butter, fifty-six cups of salad, uh, two bottles of dressing, some other odds and ends. Don't want to interrupt if you're going to get to it, but curious what your thoughts are on feast culture change to not being mandatory, but something people have to prepay pre-reg for with a few extra for a gate purchase so you can know exact numbers and dietary needs. I wasn't going to go over that. That's actually a good question because there has been a constant pull between people wanting fees to be mandatory and people wanting it to be optional. I think optional is fine. I think for Amp guard, a combination of optional and mandatory fees is good for the culture. Uh, we're in Shattered Kingdoms. I did a feast on Thursday night and Saturday night for three, for four years in a row. No, three years in a row. Then we decided to get rid of the Thursday night meal and just do a Saturday night meal. Um, and then when it came to the Thursday night and the people coming together as a group, it didn't happen because there wasn't a, a feast to get people to gather around and eat at one spot. I found that people had a more um, diverse um, friend um, gathering while eating. So people, groups interacted and stayed around longer and talked, BS, um, asked kids yeah, activities and stuff like that. So um, I found that having a mandatory feast is nice, but we also had uh, feet or meal plans for the other meals. So I think combining the two would be good for Amp Guard, but I can also see 
um, not having any meals at all except for pre-purchased meals because it does make it easier to plan for and you can keep the price down and you can plan for other people's tastes a lot easier. So I, I'm still on the mandatory feast side, but I can understand not having it be mandatory as well. All right, so we've extracted the recipe right up to the nearest number. So now you need to go purchase your goods. Um, Gwen says, I'd love to have the choice to have feast costs added, removed to the gate costs, and extra armbands or special bands would make this so easy. I mean, the change is, is good, it is easy to do. Uh, we just need an event to actually step forward and do it. Um, to see if it would actually work or not, but I just have someone added into a a budget or into a bid and see if it gets chosen. So keep a running list when you're purchasing goods. Um, you want to have? I usually just print out a list. Um. Then when I put something into the cart, I write down the price, rounding it up next to the item, cross off the item. So when I did the shopping for this feast, um, I'd write like 18, grounds be 18 pounds ground beef, $30, cross off, five big white onions, $5, and cross off. And etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, until I have everything done, then I total it, and I got a total of one hundred and forty nine dollars, which came in a dollar under budget. But because I rounded up, I'll actually be underneath that budget. So for a hundred people, when it for a hundred people, um, I ended up coming at two hundred and fifty dollars for a hundred people. So fifty dollars under budget. So after you buy your goods, you store them, then you actually have to leave and go to the event. Um, you want to have another list made. You want to double check your list, make sure everything you wanted to bring and need to bring is on that list. Uh, then before you load them up, you make sure it's all on the counter, it's all bagged up, you're, it's all put into the boxes or however you want to carry it. Then when you put it into the car, cross off the item again so you'll have two crosses once when you have it bagged in your house and you put it in your bag or your box whatever you cross it off then you put it in the car you cross it off again you double check that list um i learned through experience if you don't do that you're going to leave something behind uh, it's, it's a lot better to just be more thorough um when you're packing uh, you want to also make sure you keep cold items cold. Um, pretty basic idea, but some people forget that. So you might need coolers. Um, if they're frozen items, a lot of times I will buy frozen, not a lot of times, sometimes I'll buy frozen proteins and I'll let them thaw on the ride up there. So it, it keeps itself cool. If I'm going really far, I might need to buy some ice. But if I'm just driving like two hours and I want the chicken to thaw because it was frozen, I don't bother. I mean, I keep them in a, in a cooler, but I don't keep them on ice. So it depends on your situation, but you need to keep cold items cold. For food safety, do you require yourself and your assistants to have a food handler's permit for the area you are working in? Uh, no, I have not in the past. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea. And if a kingdom required it, then that's a cheap thing to get people to have. So it's, um, it can help people feel that the food is being prepared in a, by, in a much more trusted fashion. So I definitely see the validity in having the food handlers card. Um, I have had food handlers cards in my life, but it was because of work and not because of amp guard. So if people want it to be required, I think it's perfectly fine and acceptable um but i don't think it necessarily means that they're going to 
keep live up to the legal requirement of food safety. I just I'm a little bit pessimistic because of the workplaces I've seen not keep up with that and me correcting people about food safety and like, nope, we're doing it this way. Um so it's 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 a good thing to have, but I don't know if it's required. Uh Sploob. Um covered a lot of it. Uh let's see. Um budget. Uh where to shop. How to make your real food budget, uh, meal planning, test cook one, two, find a buddy, uh, extra plate recipe, purchasing goods. Really, we're just doing a preparing to leave. Um, so once you are packed up, you leave, um, and you get on site. I have to say that the hard work is done. You've made a plan, and it's just time to execute that plan. So you need to manage your time well. You have to stick to your timetables. You should give yourself some leeway with your timetables. The timetable should have been built up over um, your second test cook when you're doing the larger extrapolation of the recipe and extrapolating timetables based on that. You need to keep your items organized. It's a good idea to... More beer. That's that. That's a good idea. Um, it's a good idea to keep your items organized, both in the cooler, or the refrigerator, and on the counter. You want to double check your list as you unload. Err on the side of caution when serving. Um, it's better to have lore, like lukewarm food than it is to serve your feast 30 minutes late. Oh, Gwen's going to get some drinking too. Nice. So I, I when I say air on the side of caution and lukewarm food is okay, um it's tolerable. It's not really okay. Um if you let the f- food cool too much tea does count. As long as you're drinking, you're drinking. Um, yeah, so as long as the food stays warm enough that your bacteria isn't growing, then it's fine. But you have to be cautious. Um, but you also shouldn't serve it 30 minutes late. Like, almost, I'm pretty sure I have not been late to any feast that I can recall. Um, maybe one, and maybe by 10 minutes, if I'm honest with myself. But, um... It's important to say your timetables. You, I've been to a feast that is in two hours late, which is ridiculous. Uh, it just it, that's inexcusable. Um, if you plan it out correctly, you shouldn't be two hours late. Mishaps do happen. You have to take that into account. Um, if you have to go and buy something, um, you should take to that into account when you have your buddy, so they can go get your item that you need, but you need to get there on site soon enough, unpack soon enough, double check your items soon enough, go over your plan soon enough, so that when you're actually executing your mule, you have had time to fix any errors that you found while on site. What is your preferred serving strategy once you execute the feast? Waves or all at once? Um, It really depends on the setup of the kitchen. The um, atmosphere you want to create at the feast hall and how many people are at the feast. Uh, I usually put, I just usually have people line up nowadays um, for something that's supposed to be fancier, like Rosewood, for example. It's all supposed to be sit down, and that was also larger people. That actually was very, not di- not difficult, but. Um, Demanding, it took more strategy planning. I offset the um, seating and serving arrangements by getting another helper to plan that out and execute my plan uh, for for the big rosewood feast. I did. I had Kai be a the head server, and she managed plating and um, 
directing the servers. So I don't prefer sit down meals. I prefer the get in line. Um, but if you're going for something where it's a little bit more upscale, I guess, um, having servers is a nice thing. Ah, another cultural question. Is it better to give special service and food to the monarchy or would it be better to invest that money into place settings and serving dishes to make it more immersive for all? I am wholeheartedly against serving special food for special people um, just because of their station. So in that instance, I, I would not serve like prime rib to the head table where everyone else gets like chicken thighs or something like that. I would want to keep it even. Um, just, and uh, if there's dietary restrictions, that's different, but uh, yeah, I think it'd be better to use the money in a better way to improve the fees for everyone, not just a small group of people. Um, buffet style serving is way a mess according to Darius. Yeah, serving can be a big mess. It's usually why I go buffet style too. So um, that was actually about it. Um, my conclusion is plan, plan, plan. You, it's all about planning. Um, over plan. Just make sure that you're able to execute. No, you're not a boomer. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe you're a boomer compared to Sploob. <laughs> so just need to plan, plan, plan. Um, over planning is better than under planning. Even if I'm kind of an easygoing guy, but I will plan my things down to a T. Um, especially if it's something newer just to get the skill under my belt to make sure that when I actually have to execute, execute that plan, I'm able to do so at a higher caliber or uh, higher level than I would if I didn't plan and do the meals multiple times. Oh, Knights of the Boomers Ramp Guard. Yeah, I can, I can see that in most cases. So that was it for my uh, feast related stuff. Uh, if you have any other questions about feasts, I'd love to answer them. If you have questions about anything else, I'd love to answer those too. We can just talk for a while if you want. Do you think feast quality in amp card gets a bad rap? Um, I think that the quality of feast in our area has improved over the last 20 years, but the quality be before the last maybe five, ten years was very bad. I had like stew with like two pieces of meat and the rest was a broth. It wasn't even a stew. I've had burnt chicken and there, I've had uncooked rice and I've just had a lot of not good food. There's food where I, I obviously would not eat it. And, um, but that was further that's 10 plus years most of the feasts i've had have ranged from good to passable but i haven't had any that were just flat out i'm not going to eat this because it's making me sick so i'm not sure if that answers your question but but i think that the quality the bad quality is overhyped and i think it's been better lately hopefully it stays that way Uh, when where do you like to purchase your goods? Um, so I usually go to Cash and Carry. Uh, it's now Smart Food Services. Uh, then I go to Costco, Winco, and Dollar Store. Usually in that preceding order. Depends on what I need to buy. Opinion on a meal ticket bistro rather than a standard feast. Um, I did that for a couple of years just to be able to afford going to Amp Guard. So I'm for it. It's a great thing. Um, 
after I did it, uh, what bear commissary did it for a couple of events. I think it's a great idea, especially if a uh, feast event doesn't want to take on the role of organizing meals outside of the feast. I think it's a good thing to have leather, other LARPs have food vendors. And I think we should too. Now there shouldn't be too many because if there's too many, then none of them are going to make a profit. Mm. So if we had a larger audience, I think we could open up to more food vendors. But, I mean, there's definitely a saturation rate. So, yeah, I'm all for it. I mean, I, I literally called it Bee's Bistro, too. I don't know. I think you were there the one the last time I did it at Pack War. But yeah. Any other uh, questions? How's your Blackspire document thing going, Sploob? Have you got it updated, or is it still the... Yeah, the documents haven't been updated like they're supposed to be. Uh, Sploob is going to have its own dedicated website, and it's going to be like a web book. I will, once the document is updated, put it on the Kingdom website. But Sploob is doing his own personal project for trying to play around with web development. I have a question. Um, as someone that makes feasts, I'm always curious, what kind of feasts do people actually want to see in AmpGuard? Um, because sometimes I run out of ideas and I'm always looking for more ideas. Cider, nice. Um, historical feasts would be interesting. Um, I think that I've actually done like literal, like school scholarly research on food. And I think, um, you could find meals that would be palatable to the modern palate. You could also make a meal that is inspired by medieval food and not actually medieval, um, in, in itself. Um, I have not tried any of that, but I think it would be fun i would want to do it for a smaller crowd i wouldn't want to try to do it for a feast of 100 people or like that not until i tried smaller feasts uh uriel said i mean I'd rather see us move away from mandatory feasts to give feast runners better and more accurate info on the use for cooking or meal vendors. Um, I don't disagree with that. I'd like to see that too, just to try it. Um, I'm not sure if I'd want to stick there because I have my other more cultural um, reasons why I like mandatory feasts. Uh, but I am biased. Um, Asian, Eastern Asian, and Mediterranean foods would be good. I actually had a uh, pretty decent Mediterranean feast. You were there. Um, at Orcas Island. Bain did. Um, had waffles and baklava, and it was, it was pretty decent. It's probably one of my better Amcard feasts. 
Oh yeah, you were just talking about it. Uh, yeah, it's probably my favorite import feast that I've eaten too. Kismases, I'm totally against mandatory feasts. I'd love to see people who want to enjoy feasts do so and let the f feast runners have more money. Expecting a meal for three dollars is insane. Um, it is, uh, and kind of insane. Uh, we've made it work in the Northwest. Um, honestly, I haven't talked to anyone else that's done feasts lately to see what their budgets are now. Uh, the last time I cooked feasts, it was three dollars, and that was a stew two years ago at Winter Bash. Um, but yeah, but hopefully someone will try it just so we can see what it's like. Because um, I tried experimenting with stuff like that at Shattered Kingdoms because it's a smaller event. But until a larger event takes the jump and does it, we won't really know if it will work or not, like be agreeable in the public or not. Uriel says, or better pricing on events so we have money. I'm an event runner. I hate using most of my budget on food. The majority don't eat or having my entire event judged on food and less control over it. Um, that's definitely a valid point. It does take a lot of money to, to feed people, and it would um, drastically change our event budget if we didn't have mandatory fees. So it's definitely worth looking into. Darius's donation feast is where it's at. Um, there is a time when I couldn't get people to uh, donate worth at all, worth anything, and it was um, very annoying. So I I did away with donate feasts. It was just so unreliable. Splu, imagine having an event catered. That would be the dream. No one, almost no one would want to pay for that though. It is very expensive compared to what we we're used to. Nix the feast for open bar. That would be a. Uh, People might be able to get behind that. Well, we have Kismet. Kismet will come back if we do open bars. So we should plan for one. Uh, Beta Walsh said food trucks. I forget the event, but they I have heard of LARPs where they had food trucks. So still kind of talking about the open bar. I'm really not opposed to that. Um, Darius did a Quidoba. Was it Midian or Coronation? I forget. I almost drove up to Washington just to have that. Just well, also hang out with people. I don't see very often. Awesome, often. Yeah, Cormac and his, uh, has done an open bar at the last four events we went to. And it was pretty cool. Yeah. Are you the only one fine follow the battle game? Probably not. Um, if I remember correctly, there's actually a, a quest. So there's monsters versus players. And core people are questionable. I like some of them, though. The problem with an open bar by the Kingdom Sploob is I think there's like laws and stuff that get in the way. So I'm I'm competing against the video in the background. That's great. At least it's being entertaining one way or the other.
I miss playing the game. I also miss walking around with the guard, drinking, talking shit. Yeah, if we want to close this out and do a video chat or something where we're just talking and drinking, that'd be fine. No, I uh, finished it. We concluded with uh, plan, plan, plan. It's about 45 minutes long. It's about what I expected. Now it's just BSing. And if people had more questions. Oh, no. That's fine. I mean, we can chat here too. And I still got a bunch of beer to drink, so. My dream feast. Oh, um, not really sure. Um, really, my biggest dream in Amcard for feast wise was making risotto. Um, just because the time it takes to make it properly is difficult to pull off for a large amount of people. So I, I guess I've kind of already done my dream feast. It was my one thing I wanted to do on a bucket that had my bucket list was to cook risotto. So what about park level feast? Um, very similar to what I just, uh, the whole spiel I just gave, um, it was for a 50 person feast. You could do it for less. Um, the price per person will probably have to go up. I think for like 20 people, I'd, I would probably end up charging four or $5 just because when you have to buy it in smaller amounts, the prices go up. I mean, the biggest difference is um, you'll probably not have a kitchen to work in, so you'll have to plan around that uh, unless you rent a feast hall. Yeah, um, then uh, the second thing is uh, being able to afford the food because you'll probably have to get try to get the money ahead of time if you can. Uh, Gwen or Octavian said, if lands have a lot of mo extra money, they should spend it. Feasts are good for that. I agree. Um, see if, uh, and what, um, kind of meals it is you use for different types of kitchens? Uh, if I have to do open flame, I'll do something. I got a fire pit or something. I'll do like burgers or not necessarily steaks, but usually like hand steaks, something like that. Um, one thing I did when I didn't really have a kitchen was I uh, pre-cooked ham steaks and then reheating them on the grill, uh, usually with a glaze or something like that. Um, and then if I have a kitchen, depending on if I have enough ovens, stuff like that. Sometimes even if I have a kitchen, I'll just do crock pot meals and get a bunch of crock pots. Aya somehow has a thousand dollars again. I don't know where this money comes from. That's a lot of money. That is definitely a lot of money. So yeah, I think I missed the question. But oh, multiple, or Nagar asked multiple feasts at events or just one big Saturday feast. Um, I like how I've done it at Shattered Kingdoms, where it's basically one big feast on Saturday, although we have our Thursday feast. Um, then we have a meal plan for the smaller feast. I don't like trying to organize all of the meals for the whole event. Um, there's budget concerns. There's people concerns. If you do 
donated meals. I mean, sometimes those donated meals don't fall through. And so you, the event runner gets blamed for the meal not coming through, even though it's based, it's the person that offered the donated meals fault for it not falling through. So that's my pre- preferred take on, uh, me or one meal or multiple meals at amp card. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's for it's sometimes it's hard to get people to spend money. You just kind of save it up to save it up until you need it for emergencies. But you know, you get a thousand dollars for a local holding. You could do something nice, you know, once or twice a year for that kind of money. And definitely should. Yeah, I I guess the only one or two really I can think of is stealing money too. Um, I guess the only other thing would be if they keep land land holding gear is uh, some the quote unquote emergency would be paying to fix that gear. Not really an emergency, just a uh, upkeep costs. But that doesn't always, that doesn't happen often. Oh, it's totally off topic, but it's fine. I wish we'd do a huge travel day and we'd just pay for us all to have a hotel and go to like West March for a weekend or something. That'd be crazy. Yeah, land should definitely use their money in a productive way. That's for sure. Yeah, we're in a bus. Pick me up on the way on the way down. I can't remember who, but clans I went to a long while back, a group going for the kingdom or presenting all showed up in a bus they rented to get people there. I heard about that. I think it was from you too. But it's a really cool idea. Did we want to move this to another chat platform? Like, should I just invite people on a video chat on, like, one of those uh, Facebook rooms? I haven't tried them before. Or Discord. All right, that sounds good. Um, thanks for joining me for uh, Beers with Bailnorn. I am not sure what the topic is for next time. If you have any ideas, please let me know.